My name is Andrew Fleming. I go by Dozer. If I was uh, born in Illinois, just south of Chicago, um, I had a great childhood. Uh, my dad was a geologist, or he has a PhD in geology, uh, so I had a lot of cool um, memories growing up with him, camping, being outdoors. Um, my mom is also uh, an educator, um, so both my parents are teachers. My grandpa, um, who I was really close to, my mom's dad, um, he was a uh, state senator out of Indiana. I, I, he was like my hero growing up. Parents got divorced when I was 11, kind of bounced around between mom and dad. Um, I ended up going to high school um, in the north suburbs of Chicago um, in Deerfield, Illinois. I uh, lived with my dad. My dad was also um, the, worked at my high school. So my focus was not letting him down. And my focus was three sports all year long. Um, uh, academics and my goal was college and so I got there I had a partial academic scholarship uh, I went to the University of Dayton in Ohio you know my my life was on that trajectory that everybody thought I should be on and it wasn't until I got to college that I discovered alcohol for the first time and I also discovered you know a sense of freedom and I had never had either of those two things before so you know not having had those I kind of got lost in those two things and so my college years were um, a blur of alcohol and procrastination and I barely made it. Um, I graduated a little bit late, four and a half years. Um, I had a DUI towards the end of my um, collegiate career and uh, that kind of derailed my uh, aspirations to become a police officer. My plan had kind of been shattered towards the end of, uh, of my um, college days. So. I had a buddy who graduated a year before me who's from Phoenix, so um, he had moved out here already, built a brand new house, said, hey, come on, keep the party lifestyle going, we can, uh, we can kick it out here in Phoenix and, you know, we'll just keep having fun. So I continued to drink heavily, we partied, um, we were everyday partiers, drinkers. Um, didn't realize I was an alcoholic until, um, until years later looking back and reflecting on, on those times. Um, but my life took a turn. I got a girl pregnant, um, and I wasn't ready for that. But I was also kind of done with that party lifestyle, so I kind of used that as my out. Well, maybe if I marry her, um, you know, I can be done with that lifestyle. But that's not that's not how addiction works. We lasted all of nine months. Um, within that time of her being pregnant, um, I was putting everything as her fault. Uh, my addiction was. Um, ramping up. Um, I added cocaine and methamphetamine into the mix. Um, the drugs got harder. The alcohol kind of disappeared once I found drugs. I had a house that was foreclosed, a car that was repoed. Um, my, my savings, my retirement, those were all gone. Um, my job, I, at the time I was working for the state of Arizona, um, that was gone. Um, everything was gone. I was lying to family, lying to friends uh, before I knew it. Um, my son was born, I was divorced, I wanted nothing to do with him or her. Um, all I wanted was uh, my addiction. And so I had moved in with, um, with a chick who um, was also using, um, and that was my life um, from 2007 on. And so um, we were living in a foreclosed house, no electricity, no water. Um, she had two daughters of her own and she ended up getting pregnant. Um, you, I was using every day, we had no money. Um, so, you know, as anyone does, or most do, when the money runs out is, you know, you turn to crime. So um, I started committing crime to fuel my addiction um, and support her addiction as well. Um, you know, our son was born um, addicted to meth. Um, He was born three pounds. Um, and we were homeless at the time. Uh, and we were staying <clears throat> behind the 7-Eleven on I-17 and Cactus um, in a bush. Pete. People used to pass us by every day. <sighs> Nobody looked twice, and uh, 
you know, we were begging for help, but nobody was listening. Um, <clears throat> finally, somebody called the cops on us. Um, and, you know, it, it probably saved my son's life. Um, long story short, um, I had a warrant, so I ended up going to jail. Um, she ended up getting some shelter um, and some help. Um, unfortunately, uh, I haven't seen my son since. Um, and she ended up passing away, but I, I made it. Um, and my son made it. My life <clears throat> was uh, nothing but prison and addiction for, you know, for those next few years. My first time in prison, I, I did two years, um, and it was nothing but violence and rage, and uh, I hated my life, so. It was a rough, it was a rough few years. Um, I got out the first time, and I immediately violated my parole because um, I wasn't done using, um, and I knew it, and I, I, ne I just wanted to use again, so. I continued down that road, and I ended up in prison on um, on a violation, uh, parole violation again for my second time. Didn't know I had new charges uh, that that I had a warrant for, so I got out of prison that second time, and um, I already had a warrant from a while back. So I was on the run again, even though I really wasn't ready to go back to that lifestyle. I was kind of put back in it because I didn't want to go to prison. So the feeling that you have when you have when you're on the run like that is you know i have nothing to lose so i'm just gonna go balls out and you know i don't even care if i live at this point so i was rolling around with two pistols a bunch of drugs uh at all times um not sleeping um trying to make as much money as possible so i can go into prison this next time comfortably and that's where my mindset was at as ridiculous as that seems um that's where my mind was at but i got locked up the the last time and my charges were pretty serious i had a range of five to 16 years i capped it at seven and a half and so i'm still thinking okay well i'm going away for for seven and a half years um i'm still getting high in jail at this point um i had a turning point um i'm sitting in in uh my jail cell and I'm looking at myself in the little stainless steel mirror and I'm thinking, you know, who, who am I? Because I, I come from two good parents. You know, they, 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 they couldn't make it work together, but they were always there for me. I, have, I had good family, good friends, nothing but support. I had just gotten high, um, just snorted a bunch of coke that had came in and I, my mind wasn't right, but at the same time, I could, I could feel that I, I was done. And October 31st of 2013, uh, that's my sobriety date. So I really made an effort um, from that point forward to continue down that path of recovery. And so um, my story from that point on um, is focused on nothing but bettering myself. And so I really got in tune with myself. I started reflecting on um, on my life, where I was at currently, and where I wanted to be. Um, started getting honest with myself because I had never been honest with myself. I was always living in an image that wasn't me or trying to be somebody that I wasn't. So um, for the first time, I got the real raw version of myself and I was able to look at that and see what was working, what wasn't. Um, and in being honest in the process, I was able to set attainable, achievable goals that I had never been able to do before. So um, at the request of somebody after I, I got to prison this last time, um, I started journaling and it started out as a, as a workout journal. Um, you know, he's like, you know, I, I've been journaling for years and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what that means. I don't, what are you talking about, like a diary? And he's like, no, just, you know, whatever it is that you can think to write about, write about. And it was still kind of overwhelming. So I was like, okay, well, um, I'll just keep a workout log. And so he's like, the most important thing is you pick a time a day and you make that time to write in your journal. So you know, in prison, they do counts throughout the day. And so you're stuck on your bed for uh, sometimes, depending on where you're at, you know, 30 minutes to an hour um, until they clear counts. So that's a perfect time to reflect for me. So I use that time 
um, what started out as a workout journal and then it slowly became, you know, accountability journal for me. And, you know, I would say things like, okay, well, um, you know, I did 100 push-ups today, I'm going to try to do 200 push-ups tomorrow. Or, man, I'd really like to write uh, my friend Mike, so I'm going to make sure I write him by Saturday. And so that's how it started, it was just like, kind of like some to-do lists. Um, but then it got into some, you know, some pretty good reflection. And so I use that as the platform for um, me to hold myself accountable. So that's, that's where I get my, um, that's where I really got into being honest with myself. That's where I got into holding myself accountable because if I put it on paper, I gave it power. And so um, that gave it some weight to me. And so if I chose to share that with my dad or with my mom or family, that gave it even more weight and more accountability. So um, I, really, I really got in tune with myself, um, getting honest with myself. I used it, um, I used that time in prison to find out who I was and, and, and what I wanted to be. And so I made my, you know, with that change in me, I, I also stopped that violent behavior and, and that hatred and that unnecessary nonsense that I was doing the first two times. And so I was able to make my way down from maximum custody to minimum custody. And with that became more freedom and more programming. And so there was an opportunity um, on the minimum yard that I, that I finished my time at. Um, the yard was craving recovery and um, guys, can, guys were kind of gravitating towards me because I was always working out and being positive and um, writing in my journal and promoting that stuff, um, even without doing so, just that's who I was and people saw that and wanted a part of it. Um, and so I approached um, one of the counselors at, at the prison and the warden and we kind of got a program off the ground, a peer mentor program. And so that was the first taste that I had of really um, trying to help others in, a, in an organized fashion. And so I became a peer mentor in prison. Um, started doing yoga, 12 steps, anger management, parenting, cognitive thinking. Um, we got all this stuff off the ground from nothing. Um, and what started off on a few picnic tables, um, you know, we got into classrooms and um, into buildings on the yard that, you know, hadn't been accessed without supervision ever. Um, and so we were entrusted with those things and we took real pride in our recovery there and fostered that recovery and kind of turned that yard around because um, it was full of drugs and nonsense before. And so we created a whole new culture there um, and something I'm really proud of. And so that's that first taste that I got of, of um, that, that service to others. And so I knew I wanted to continue that um, when I got out. And so um, I got out of prison this last time and I, I didn't have anything, I didn't have more than $50 to my name. I had nothing other than the outfit on my back. Uh, I went to a halfway house um, and I worked odd jobs to, to pay the bills. Opportunity presented itself um, at uh, a local detox and um, behavioral health provider um, and where I could be a peer to other people. Um, and so I got into um, to that line of work, a case management, peer work, um, peer support helping others with their addiction, helping others um, end their homelessness. Um, and so into that, I, I started to be able to make some money, good money, to do what I was already wanting to do. And um, sharing my story and helping the next person by leveraging my own lived experiences. And, um, you know, I met my wife um, in that training. So um, I get emotional, sorry. Um, it's so many, <clears throat> it's so many good things that have happened to me because I've done the next right thing and I've done what I should be doing this whole time. And if you, I'm a firm believer in good people, good things happen to good people. And I was finally that good person who, who I was raised to be. And so. I had the job, I, I met my wife. Um, we got married, you know, like three months later, uh, real quick. Um, she got pregnant right away. Everything's fallen into place. Um, uh, we both moved on from that, from that role, but we'll be able, forever grateful to that company for um, the place where we met. Uh, for us to be able to make it and, and make it together, um, it's pretty cool. Uh, 
Everything that's happened to me has happened to me for a reason, um, and I use it every day to help people. So in my role now, um, I'm a member advocate with a health plan, and so I still get to be a service, I, but on a bigger scale now, I get to help people um, navigate multiple systems, um, you know, criminal justice system, housing, um, the health plan, everything. Anything in life that they need help with, I'm able to use my experience. And um, so yeah, I mean, to be, to not even be out three years right now at this point, and to have a house, have a, one car that's paid off, another one that we own, um, have a beautiful family, beautiful home. We don't want for anything. Um, we have no debt. Um, you know, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. My life right now is everything that I thought I could never have. Uh, some of the stuff that I never knew was possible for somebody with my background. Um, it's, ha it's happening to me or it's already happened to me. So, um, you know, that's, that's my story. Um, I'm forever grateful um, for my journey.